Tom here from Learn Systems, and I did a video on XCPNG and over allocation of memory and how Zen handles shrinking and growing memory in a running VM, how that passes between different servers and the ins and outs of it. I'd ask in that video if you'd like to see a video on over provisioning CPUs. And a lot of people answered yes. And I just ran into a consulting job where the CPUs were over provisioned in a bad way. And I thought, hey, I should really do this video because there's some clarification that I think would be helpful. And it's kind of fun to play with this. And it's something I encourage you to play with in your lab to gain a better understanding. Now, yes, you can. If you didn't want to watch the whole video, just the answer is yes, no problem. You can have all these different VMs assigned the full number of CPUs available in a system. It will work. But there's some exceptions when you don't want to do that. And we'll go into the more detailed ones of like, hey, if you have too many things requesting too much load at once, you're going to get inefficient. But I also wanted to talk about the NUMA boundaries because I won't be covering that in detail, but I want to make sure you're aware it exists. And what that means is when a VM has more vCPU cores allocated to it than exist in a single CPU on the underlying host, it will have to cross the NUMA boundaries when performing CPU instructions. That means if you don't have a board with a single processor, but a multiprocessor board, and each one of those processors in the board has X number of cores, yes, you can actually assign the cores that are in two different CPUs all into a single virtual machine. But once you start crossing NUMA boundaries, you end up with some memory problems going back and forth and it can become very inefficient. So it's probably not the best idea to do that. I can't really think of, and maybe someone will leave a comment down below. There's an exception when you think that's a good idea, but I generally find it not to be. So if you have a dual CPU system and there's 24 cores in each CPU, you don't want to assign any more than 24 to a single VM. That way it doesn't have some of those running on the other CPU. Zen is aware of the number of cores and where those NUMA boundaries are, and it has been for a long time. So XCPNG will manage that perfectly fine and said, if you assign a certain number of cores, it won't grab a few cores from each one of the processors. It's smarter than that. Now, as far as over-provisioning CPUs, it's actually not a bad thing to do, and I've got mine way over-provisioned because I know that all these VMs I have don't work in concert with each other. So one of the real reasons you may want to do this is you have workloads that are ephemeral. They're when you want something. For example, I run Graylog. And when I do a query, I want Graylog to have all the power. When I compile Zen Orchestra from source, I want it to have all the power. But I'm usually not compiling Zen Orchestra at the same time I'm querying Graylog. When if I am, it won't cause the system to crash. They'll just, well, fight with each other a little bit of who's got the most resources. And yes, I'll leave a link to an article because you can weight all the CPUs inside of Zen to each VM. So you can have a winner versus a balance. So that's kind of a you decision and there are ways to do that. But generally, because I'm not doing those things at the same time, it is very efficient for me to do this. So I have all the power when I need it and everything goes into idle and all that extra idle time can be passed along to any other VMs. So let's dive into some of the intricacies and show you how it works. It's actually pretty simple. And I will show you that, yes, you can do this without restarting a Linux VM. You can just uh, dynamically size the processors up and down. Now let's start here in the Zen dashboard and you can see I've got 48 vCPUs out of 24. So I've already doubled my allocation in this. Now let's go over here to the host itself so we can see that this is a 24 core system specifically and there's a link down below to the build of this system. It's an AMD Ryzen 9 5900X 12 core processor. So it has the 24 available but it's physically 12 core processor and we'll go back over here to the two VMs that we have. And right here, Pharonix 1, Pharonix Lab 2, we see that there's 24 CPUs assigned to each. Now, the first thing that may come up is how do you reassign CPUs? Do you have to shut the VM down? That depends on the operating system. It is very dependent on whether or not the operating system supports dynamically moving the CPUs. So right now I've got 24 cores assigned. Let me walk you through downsizing it. So I've SSHed in, we're just going to run HTOP. You can see that there's 24 cores. So let's go ahead and do this. We're going to go shrink it down to 12 cores. Switch back over and you'll see all these becoming absent. So yes, you can absolutely dynamically resize these. This is another option of if you want to temporarily give something more power, you can give it some more power and then revert that back down later. Uh, I want it to have 24 cores again. So we're actually going to go back over here, put 24 and it'll put us back up at all the cores and they'll become back available to this system. 
pretty slick that that supports that. Uh, I didn't have to restart it. Of note, that may still crash services that run on the system because if those systems or those services have a dependency where they count the number of cores and maybe spawn their processes based on that information and you downsize it, you could cause some crashing or overloading problems or certainly some inefficient problems because it would have spawned a number of processes expecting a certain number of cores. So it is still very application dependent to be able to do this. Um, just some food for thought. One more thing that's worth noting, you may run into this problem, going over here to advanced. You may notice that you were not able to expand yours without shutting it down the first time. But once you've done it, you'll see this right here, and that's the CPU limits. The CPU limits are set to 24, and currently we have 24 of 24. But if we downsize this back down to like 12, go over here, go over to advanced, and it will then show us only using 12 out of the 24. The other issue you may run into is this secondary number being the max. You have to have it on a host that supports that max. This can be a challenge you run into when you migrate this to another host and that host maybe doesn't have as many cores. You'll get a no host available to start. And you can, when this machine is off, you can stop this VM and set the CPU limit, the high limit to how many CPUs you want available to this. Now you may have noticed that the virtual machines were named Pharonix, Pharonix 1 Lab, Pharonix 2 Lab. And we're going to do a live demo here in a moment, but I wanted to show you what the results are from running the Pharonix Linux kernel compilation. Now, the Linux kernel does saturate all the CPU cores, and when we assign 24 cores to a single VM, and only that VM running on the system, so it's just by itself, it took 68 seconds to compile the Linux kernel. If we assign 24 cores to two VMs and both machines simultaneously at the same time compile the Linux kernel, the total time was 131 seconds to compile for each VM. I don't have a way of displaying both of them doing it at the same time because Phronix has one upload part, but that took just about double the time, which is as expected. It's actually kind of surprising. There's a little bit of efficiency, I'm guessing, uh, was gained because it took slightly less than double the time. But when you're saturating the CPU fully, it's going to take and balance it between these two CPUs. But if you have processes that are kind of up and down and you have two different systems, they may not align and you may actually get an efficiency by having them over provision. So one's running a completely separate task that's kind of needing CPU at some time, but not all the time. And same goes for the other. And that's where you can get the system to still be more efficient, even though you've over provisioned CPUs. All right, so I'm logged into my Pharonix lab one and lab two machines. We're just gonna run the Phronix test suite benchmark build Linux kernel. So we can suck up some CPU time. Option one, I don't care about saving your results because I already did it in the previous test. And now we can watch the system get loaded up here. And there we go. You can see it ramping up right here. Now we can switch over to the stats inside of here and same thing. It's pinning all the cores. And if we go to the Ryzen Labrador system itself, look at the stats, it's rising up quite a bit here. Now I've got the other VM running, but it's not doing anything. This one's idle. So it's barely taking away anything from the other. I could stop it, but it's not doing much. So once again, I've got this VM just pulling all the CPU. So it's peeking out right here. And we can go back over to the net data and see, yeah, we're pretty solid on CPU usage. But let's go ahead and stop that because I want to show you what happens what, when you run both services at the same time. So what we're going to do here, and this is Tmux if you're not familiar with it, we're going to set the panes to be synchronized so I can type the same command at the same time into Windows. And the command to do that is set w synchronize panes. So we're going to go ahead and do that. Now the panes are synchronized. And if I uh, type, you can see it'll run both windows at the same time. We wanted to go ahead and clear, and we're going to go ahead and kick off the Pharonix build. So we're running the Pharonix test suite simultaneously on both machines, option one for both. Don't need to save it. And I want to show you what the CPUs do differently now. So it's going to take a second to ramp up. So we'll get this out of the way. And while this ramping up, we'll look at what the CPU time looks on a normal one here. And Specifically, let's look at the CPU steal time, which is nothing. This is that small 1% you've seen that the other system was using. So that's CPU steal time means that it was waiting. Even though it had control of the processor, it was waiting for the commands to run. It's pretty low right here. It's a small percentage, so nothing you really have to worry about. 
Let's go over here to current time and zoom in. And here's the ramp up, but you notice that the yellow is not quite as big. Let's go down to the steal time. The steal time is running roughly about 50% here. What that means is we have two VMs fighting over this. The hypervisor is going back and forth. It can only give, because we didn't weight them differently, they're weighted the same, that CPU time to each of these devices. So the steal time is that time in between going, you said I have a processor, but you don't actually let me use it. So that's measured in the Linux kernel as steal time. So you actually can see when you're having a problem. And by the way, NetData is a really cool tool to be able to do this, but you can also see it using things like HTOP, where you can go in there and look and see what the steal time is. But hey, I think it's cool to use the net data here and get the idea for what's going on. And this is what gives you those tools to troubleshoot the CPU and understand what's happening. And if we go over here to this system, you can see this is where it ran before, and this is what it looks like running now. It's only getting about 50% of the CPU. And if we go to the other one here, it's only getting 50% of the CPU. Now, hopefully this video left you with a better understanding of how CPU over provisioning works, why it may be a good idea, may not be a good idea, depending on the workload that you have. Also check out my video on net data. It's a great tool to help you troubleshoot some of these problems. And uh, that's linked down below along with the CPU weight documentation over next CPNG. And do a little Googling on the NUMA cores. That can be a fun deep dive into having a deeper understanding of how all that works. As always, head over to my forums for a more in-depth discussion or leave your thoughts and comments down below. I love hearing from all of you. Thanks.